Imagine standing in a dusty village in northern Ghana where a young girl once walked 10 kilometers to reach her school. Now imagine that same girl accessing world-class education from her home using a tablet connected to a wireless network powered by hope. That network is Maxwell Chikambutso's creation, and it is more than a web of wires or waves, it is a lifeline. Stretching across 20 states in Africa, this network has quietly connected 20 million people in ways few could have imagined. It did not begin with government funding or billion-dollar infrastructure projects, but with a single vision, connection as a form of transformation. Maxwell believed that technology should never be a privilege but a right available to every human being. That belief led to the birth of his revolutionary network, designed to reach the unreachable and empower the forgotten. Across rural landscapes and urban sprawls, this network wove its way into lives with precision and purpose. Communities that once functioned in isolation were now linked through invisible bridges of digital empowerment. Children in Uganda now join virtual classrooms alongside peers from Kenya, Nigeria, and Malawi. Farmers in Tanzania receive weather forecasts and market prices directly on solar-charged phones powered by the network. Mothers in Cameroon use telemedicine apps to consult doctors hundreds of miles away. Youth in remote Ethiopian towns now code mobile apps and dream of tech startups. All of this became possible not because of charity but because of vision. Maxwell's team knew that connectivity wasn't just about internet access. It was about economic access, education access, healthcare access, and hope. They laid down hardware across borders, set up solar-powered hubs in off-grid villages, and installed low-energy routers on rooftops. Each installation was more than a technical achievement. It was a declaration that no one would be left behind. In Zambia, an entire generation of students began passing national exams for the first time thanks to e-learning portals. In South Sudan, refugee camps lit up with opportunities as people accessed digital job boards and training. In Sierra Leone, communities gathered nightly to watch news broadcasts on shared screens powered by the network's clean energy modules. But these statistics, 20 million lives, 20 states, only scratch the surface. Each number holds a heartbeat, a name, a story. Take Maria, a nurse from Mozambique who once had to walk hours to deliver messages to doctors in town. Now, she uses a handheld device on Maxwell's network to instantly report symptoms and request medicine supplies. Or Ayo, a cocoa farmer from Nigeria, whose income tripled after learning modern farming techniques through agricultural webinars. Or Deka, a Somali student who scored a university scholarship after accessing online prep courses at her village's solar tech center. Maxwell's network made them visible, connected, and empowered. His goal wasn't to dominate the tech space. It was to liberate the human spirit through connection. And that's why this network is unlike anything the continent has ever seen. It is built not just with cables and code, but with compassion, community, and courage. Local technicians were trained to maintain the hubs, creating thousands of jobs in places where employment was scarce. Women-led cooperatives were formed to oversee digital literacy campaigns in villages. Youth innovation labs were opened, where teenagers pitched ideas and built prototypes using free internet and mentorship. At every layer, Maxwell's design included people as the center, not just users but builders and leaders. As the network grew, so did its influence. Entire districts began organizing digitally, advocating for infrastructure, health, and legal reforms via online platforms. Grassroots movements started broadcasting on localized media stations run on the network. Stories once buried under poverty and neglect now surfaced and spread, creating solidarity among distant towns. The sense of isolation faded as people realized they were not alone in their struggles or their dreams. But this wasn't a smooth path. The journey to build across 20 African states came with threats, skepticism, and sabotage. Private telecom giants tried to block expansion by lobbying governments with deep pockets. Cables were stolen, equipment was vandalized, and local misinformation painted the effort as a foreign agenda. Still, the team pushed on, improvising with mesh networking and open source tools. Maxwell's engineers worked nights from modified shipping containers, sending updates over battery-powered satellites. Communities guarded network nodes like sacred treasures, 
refusing to let setbacks kill their only lifeline to the future. Maxwell himself visited each region at least once, personally installing routers and training young engineers. He listened more than he spoke, learning local needs before deploying global tech. It was never about imposing a solution, it was about co-creating transformation. That's why the network became embedded in the social fabric of each area. In Ghana, it became the backbone of a mobile banking revolution for unbanked citizens. In Burundi, it became a data lifeline for maternal health tracking in rural clinics. In Togo, artisans began live-streaming their craft and selling goods across borders. In Malawi, a solar-powered network classroom now hosts Pan-African hackathons. These stories didn't just change local lives, they inspired policies. Governments started drafting digital infrastructure strategies that mirrored Maxwell's model. Policymakers invited his team to design national frameworks for equitable tech access. Universities partnered to roll out open-source curriculum platforms powered by his network. NGOs shifted strategy from charity to empowerment, recognizing the potential of connected communities. Maxwell's work ignited a movement, and suddenly, Africa was no longer seen as the recipient of tech, but the birthplace of innovation. Tech leaders across the globe flew in to witness the model firsthand. Many left humbled, realizing that the future of networking wasn't in skyscrapers, but in villages powered by solar panels and vision. But Maxwell didn't seek applause, he sought momentum. He expanded training centers, opened women-only tech labs, and launched language-accessible coding boot camps. He believed connectivity without inclusion was just another form of exclusion. That's why the network adapted to every culture, language, and environment it touched. In the Congo rainforest, nodes were embedded in treehouses. In the Sahara, cooling systems kept routers operational under scorching heat. In swampy regions, floating relay stations connected island villages. In conflict zones, encrypted comms helped activists and relief teams coordinate safely. It wasn't just connectivity, it was contextual connectivity. And that made all the difference. By tailoring technology to fit people, not the other way around, the network grew organically. Children began dreaming beyond borders. Grandparents reconnected with distant families. And diaspora Africans logged in to teach from abroad. The diaspora became donors, volunteers, and digital mentors. Africa's scattered stories began weaving together across invisible threads of code. Hope returned, not as an abstract ideal, but as a lived, digital reality. That's what makes Maxwell's network so revolutionary. It is not merely a technical achievement, it is a human miracle in motion. And it's only halfway through, because the next 10 states and the next 10 million lives await connection. The journey continues, driven by belief, by people, by the unbreakable bond of shared progress. The next phase of Maxwell's journey began not with expansion, but with reflection. He and his team studied the data pouring in from every region, mapping patterns of use, impact, and potential. They discovered that beyond the immediate benefits of connection, something deeper was happening. People were creating their own ecosystems. In Malawi, network users had self-organized into digital cooperatives, trading goods and services without leaving their villages. In Chad, students created a digital magazine reporting on local issues using only their smartphones. In Liberia, a youth-led weather tracking team used connected sensors to predict floods and save entire villages. The network wasn't just a service, it was a tool of self-determination. And that realization pushed Maxwell to think even bigger. What if every person connected wasn't just a consumer of information, but a contributor to it? What if the network became not just a bridge to knowledge, but a platform for creation, innovation, and leadership? To achieve this, Maxwell launched the Create Local, Share Global initiative across all 20 connected states. Through this program, anyone with access could publish courses, apps, stories, or services directly to the network. It turned villages into virtual campuses, clinics into global health forums, and markets into cross-border economies. In Benin, a blind programmer developed an app for visual impairment using local dialect speech-to-text features. In Rwanda, a group of teenage girls built a platform for tracking period health using indigenous knowledge systems. In Zimbabwe, 
elders recorded oral histories and uploaded them to community clouds for future generations. It became clear that the network was now growing itself, with users fueling its next stage. Yet, the question remained, how would this momentum be sustained in the long term? Maxwell answered that by decentralizing power. Each connected state was given control over its local node clusters, training programs, and data governance policies. The central leadership offered only coordination, mentorship, and infrastructure support. This created a model where the network was owned not by Maxwell, but by Africa itself. Ownership, bred innovation. In Guinea, rural women formed a council to manage the local data hub and used revenues to fund girls' scholarships. In Sudan, former nomads used mobile devices to track herd movements, reducing conflict and increasing productivity. In Angola, mobile repair shops doubled as literacy centers where children learned coding while their parents got connectivity. None of this was in the original blueprint. It evolved because people adapted it to their needs. That adaptability became a cornerstone of the network's continued success. But with expansion came complexity. In remote regions with no electricity grid, powering even solar routers proved difficult during rainy seasons. In areas plagued by conflict, maintaining uninterrupted service was nearly impossible. Maxwell's solution was twofold, innovation and resilience. He introduced kinetic energy routers powered by motion, so children walking to school helped generate the energy needed to stay online. He launched satellite relay stations deployed via drone to restore service in war-torn areas. He partnered with local peace builders to ensure nodes were protected during clashes. Every challenge became an invitation to reimagine what's possible. The network was now a living organism, constantly adapting and self-healing. Governments began to notice, not just for the political potential, but for its power to solve actual problems. In Kenya, health ministries used the network to trace outbreaks and distribute vaccines in real time. In Nigeria, it became the backbone of a rural microloan system that saw repayment rates skyrocket thanks to digital literacy. In Uganda, it was used to teach civic education and increase voter participation in regions previously cut off. But the most powerful stories were still the quiet ones. Like Musa, an 11-year-old from Eritrea, who built a remote weather station from recycled parts and used the network to report data to regional researchers. Or Halima, a 70-year-old grandmother in the Central African Republic, who learned to read using a local language e-book downloaded from the community center. Or Omandi, a fisherman from Lake Victoria, who now live streams his catch to online markets and gets fair prices directly from buyers. Each of them represents what Maxwell always knew, that the right connection doesn't just change your access, it changes your worth. By lifting people into a shared space of dignity and opportunity, the network had become the most powerful force for equality on the continent. Yet, Maxwell remained focused on the future. He launched a plan called Network 2.0, which would include offline-first capabilities, allowing access to key content even in disconnected scenarios. He rolled out mesh hubs for mountainous zones and low-orbit backup satellites for harsh climates. He trained a new generation of regional network stewards, half of whom were women, ensuring diversity in leadership. In countries like Somalia and DR Congo, where traditional systems had failed, the network became a source of governance and community building. Locals formed digital parliaments, debated policies, and organized aid distribution with full transparency. These grassroots systems, powered by Maxwell's infrastructure, created a new form of decentralized African democracy. And yet, even with this success, Maxwell never marketed the network with logos, branding, or political flags. He believed the power belonged to the people, not to any government, company, or name. That humility became his strength. It disarmed critics, attracted collaborators, and deepened trust among users. Even competing telecom companies eventually began leasing bandwidth through his framework because it reached where they could not. The global tech community began to shift its gaze. Conferences once dominated by Silicon Valley now featured African engineers, rural youth, and indigenous innovators sharing real solutions. Maxwell's story was no longer just a story, it was a case study in human-first technology. He was invited to universities, to the UN, to Davos, but he always returned to the villages. 
because he knew that every breakthrough began with listening. As the 20th state came online, a celebration erupted across the network. People danced, sang, coded, streamed, healed, and dreamed in unison. It was not just a milestone, it was a promise. Promise that every voice matters. A promise that the future can be built from the ground up. A promise that Africa can lead not by imitation, but by innovation rooted in reality. Maxwell Chikambutso's network was never about speed, profits, or data. It was about people. And in the end, that is what made all the difference. With 20 million lives changed, the world must now ask, what happens when we stop waiting to be saved and start building together? What happens when the tools of change are placed in every hand, regardless of wealth, geography, or background? Maxwell knew the answer. He saw it in every classroom lit by solar panels, in every mother uploading health records, in every youth teaching others how to code. He knew that when you connect people, you connect possibility. And that possibility becomes unstoppable. The next chapter is unwritten, but the foundation has been laid. The network is here. The people are ready. And the future is calling.